the Heart and Vascular Centre Grand Rounds. Uh, before I introduce the speaker today, uh, let me go through the mandatory housekeeping notes. Uh, we're broadcasting this via live stream on YouTube, and so if you have questions, please use the microphones that will be distributed. Uh, this will post immediately after the presentation. Uh, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. We're kind of uh, trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. There's only 0.6% of all YouTube channels, and we get a little award from YouTube if we hit that. Uh, for our viewers, if you'd like to submit questions, uh, text DEBAKEY, uh, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607, and you can send questions, and we will moderate those. You may also submit questions via the live stream feed. Uh, I just remind everybody, there's two upcoming conferences. Uh, in uh, June 5th to 7th, we're going to run pre-intern training for vascular residents. And June 17th, uh, we have uh, cardiology for the non-cardiologist that Dr. Shah leads. With that done, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for this morning. Uh, Dr. Schimmerhorn is the Chief of the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and is the George Clues Professor uh, at Harvard Medical School. He's a past president of the New England Society for Vascular Surgery and a distinguished fellow for the Society of Vascular Surgery. He's a member of the European Society, and the American College of Surgeons, the American Heart Association, and one of his more interesting roles is he serves as a member of the Medical Devices Advisory Panel for the FDA and as a consultant for the Agency for Health Research and Quality. A member of three editorial boards, international leader, for which he's renowned for in clinical effectiveness research. He, he takes the clinical questions and puts the numbers that allow you to make objective determinations. He gave a wonderful talk last night on carotid standing. He's a particular interest in and focus on new endovascular therapies around aortic aneurysms and complex aortic surgery, which you're going to hear about in interventions. He has an IDE for uh, what we call PMEGs, Physician Modified Endographs. He's an NIH-funded lab, has authored more than 300 papers, and is he, um, and they're, they're in all of the top journals. So he's a mentor to numerous surgical residents, and today he's going to talk to us about advanced imaging guidance for complex endovascular interventions. So, Mark, I apologize we got you down here in spring break, uh, but the expanded audience will see you on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It is truly an honor to uh, be here. Uh, and I think I said uh, this is a little bit of uh, bringing coals to Newcastle here for me to come here and talk about aortas and to talk about imaging. Um, but we'll go ahead and uh, give it a shot anyway. So my disclosures, uh, I do have relationships with uh, several companies here, none of which are going to be represented in anything that I'm going to show today, and I don't take any personal income. So uh, going back to the start, um, I have to say a couple words about Juan Perotti. Uh, I, I went down and studied with Juan Perotti in, in 2000 after I finished my fellowship. Uh, the man's a genius. He did the first EVAR, endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm, in September of 1990. And he published his first five cases a year later in the Annals of Vascular Surgery because it didn't get into uh, JVS. Um, but this really brought EVAR to all of us uh, eventually. Um, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't mention Nikolai Volodos, who actually did the first endograft in 1985. Um, he did his work in the Ukraine. He published in Russian, so it didn't reach the English-speaking audience uh, for many years. He was actually born in, in either Poland or Belarus, um, but did practiced in Kharkiv. And his first case was actually an iliac stent graft that he put a fem-tib bypass on. Uh, then he did the same thing, but to the abdominal aorta in 1987, which was done through a laparotomy. Uh, and he did, did his uh, uh, proximal anastomosis with a uh, stent graft. But he actually did the first endograft from a transfemoral root in 1988, two years before Juan, um, to treat a, the thoracic aorta. Uh, and so he truly was the first. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, he didn't, didn't get the recognition because he uh, did not write in, in English and it didn't get translated and uh, it was not spread as widely. But he is another pioneer that deserves uh, recognition. Now, both of them were sort of laughed at uh, when they first uh, presented their data, you know, uh, published in the Annals of Vascular Surgery rather than JVS. But we know what happened uh, subsequently. 
Now I show this, uh, he didn't have this nice uh, C-arm here, he had a, a C-arm that produced images like this and you can see he needed two separate frames just to see from the renals down to the iliac bifurcation and you can't even see the femorals on here. And so that's what Juan was working with uh, back in, in 1990. Things have changed though, fortunately over time. This is our first hybrid OR that was built in 07. And then we had another one built in 2016. And then more recently, our, our newest room uh, in 2019. And I'll show uh, some work that we did in this room. I'm talking about aortic aneurysms uh, because they are still an important cause of death in the United States and around the world. And the deaths are probably more than we realize because a lot of sudden deaths get labeled as a cardiac death when they may have been due to an aneurysm. EVAR steadily grew since it was introduced in the U.S. at the turn of the century. And by 2008 in Medicare patients, three quarters of all repairs for intact aneurysms were endovascular and a third of rupture repairs were endo. More recent data shows that we're up at 85% of intact repairs and more than half of rupture repairs are done with an endovascular approach. And fenestrated and branch repairs were introduced uh, a little over 10 years ago and have grown. We need to update uh, this data to show what the current uh, spread is. We're working on that. So I'm going to talk about uh, complex EVAR, which includes juxtarenal EVAR, uh, shown here in B, which can be treated with a commercially available device, the ZFEN, with fenestrations uh, for the renal arteries uh, and the SMA. They can be stented or unstented. The stents can be covered or uncovered. This is the most common configuration with two covered stents for the renals and a scallop for the SMA. But I'm going to talk more about the rest of the complex uh, EVAR, the suprarenal, the type 4 thoracoabdominal aneurysms, where we now do either open repair or some type of complex endovascular repair. And we've looked at the state of uh, complex endovascular repair within the VQI and compared it to open repair for these uh, uh, aneurysms. And we've seen that there's a lower mortality with an endovascular approach perioperatively. Complications, certain ones are lower. Renal dysfunction, renal failure, and MI are lower with fenestrated and branched uh, EVAR, uh, but the stroke rate is higher. Late survival is the same, open versus EVAR. Now, when we break it down, you know, there's the commercial FEVAR for those juxtarenals, then there's PMEGs if you need more uh, coverage, and the other option is chimney snorkel. And we found that the stroke rate is quite a bit higher with the chimney snorkel technique. Um, and that's because this pretty much routinely requires upper extremity access, which is associated with a much higher stroke risk. Uh, so we try to avoid that, and, and I do uh, PMEGs. Um, we've seen in the NISQIP database that uh, complex EVAR compared to complex uh, open repair, the open repair has doubled the mortality, uh, five times the renal complication and four times uh, any complication. Now there will be commercially available devices coming soon um, that will let us treat uh, more extensive uh, complex AAA and thoracoabdominal aneurysms, um, but those are not quite available yet. Um, and so for me, I've got my uh, IDE, which allows me to treat these juxtarenal, suprarenal, and thoracoabdominal, uh, not just type four, but uh, all the way up and including aneurysms. But I'm gonna focus on the complex uh, AAA for today. These all get branches and, or fens, depending on the distance, and they're all covered stents. Now, when I started doing this a little over 10 years ago, um, it was a really complicated process. Um, I had to write every step down uh, so that I could remember it uh, for the next time. Uh, but as the volume increased over time, we got it down to a much uh, better system. We have all the alpha cook grafts. Uh, we have all of their specifications uh, in a file that we pull out for each one. And I'll go through how we grab all these numbers and plan these cases. We put the, the anatomy into Terra Recon, and we start by measuring the clock faces for the celiac, SMA, renals, etc. Then we mark the exact locations of each of the uh, branch vessels, 
the celiac, SMA, and renals again. And we also look at the inner vessel diameter at that level. Uh, Cook uses an inner vessel diameter, the minimum diameter. I actually use an average vessel diameter. Becomes important in terms of where the renals line up and where there's bunching of your excess fabric because with the oversizing. Then we make our plan uh, with which graphs we're going to use. This is actually my most uh, common graph, the 3228178 alpha tapered device. And then I use a gore bifurcate typically down below that and we plan out exactly what we're going to do there. <clears throat> then we also look at the branch vessels. This patient that I'm going to show today uh, has a replaced common hepatic, so this was the splenic artery. We look at the length of it down to any important branches, the diameter. The uh, SMA here has that replaced common hepatic, just two centimeters from its origin. And then we look at the renals, and we look at the diameters there to plan the stents that we're going to use. Now, to converting those clock faces to uh, distances uh, that we measure laterally on a graft, we have to calculate the arc length, which you can do just by using the formula, circumference equals two pi r or pi times diameter. Um, you know, there's 12 hours uh, in a clock, so you can divide by 12 to get the one hour distance, which uh, Cook gives you this program that cal gets it calculated here or you can divide by 24 to get half hour, or you can divide by 48 to get 15 minute intervals. And that's what we use is 15 minute intervals. You can do it yourself, or you can just plug it into this spreadsheet that Cook uh, will, will give you. Um, and they use the inner vessel diameter. I use the average vessel diameter, which is a little bit larger, which pushes those renals a little bit further laterally, because I like to have some bunching anteriorly here between the renals and the uh, celiac and SMA, not all posteriorly. I had one ZFEN case where there was so much uh, infolding posteriorly because of the posterior diameter reduction that I had a big type 3 endoleak that was difficult to resolve, but eventually we did resolve it with a palma stent. So uh, I use circumferential diameter reduction, and I like to have some bunching here anteriorly, and that's why I do it differently. So this is what we currently uh, use to plan our cases, and then we print this out. This is a, a, in a PowerPoint. We store everything for uh, posterity in, in our IDE, and then also so that we can go back and, and see what we had done. And then we post these around the room while we're working so that we know exactly what we're doing. All of our clock faces, those vessel diameters, and then the distance down from the reference, which is the splenic in this case, and then the uh, arc lengths, uh, the distance off the midline. Once you have all that, you can start doing some uh, trial and error to figure out where to put these fenestrations so that they'll not be uh, right on one of the stent wires. And we also have all over here the uh, stents we're going to use in our branches and any uh, key information as well. You know, whether it's a small branch that we want to preserve or if we're going to uh, avoid it, sometimes a wire will go out into one of these small branches, so you need to be aware that they're there and look for it. And then we have our bifurcate down here and just a, a note that we're going to use this 12 French Oscor to deal with our inner branch that we're using for that SMA because we had only two centimeters and an 11 millimeter vessel out there. Uh, so we thought an inner branch with a Viabon would work better. Now I've experimented with different ways of figuring out how to optimize the location of those fenestrations. I played with uh, 3D printed aortas, but I don't like it because it's tough to, when you rotate this, it, you develop the torque at one end but not at the other. Even if you try to pull on both ends, you get it at the ends but not in the middle. So I didn't think that was very reliable. So. I worked with uh, one of my now partners who was a trainee and then uh, a professor at MIT and her trainee and charged them with uh, developing a program that would tell us exactly where to put these fenestrations to get the best fit. And we came up with this uh, FenFit program, which uh, we do have a patent pending for. Basically, we have all the off-the-shelf information for the graphs that we modify, then we input that patient anatomy and then it will find the optimal alignment and generate a report. So you can see here, you can click on any uh, of the alpha grafts, uh, and you, know, you could use other companies and they could be input into this uh, without any problem. And then you input the data here that we talked about, the clock faces, the distances apart, and then the program, what it does, we've told it to prioritize the SMA and the celiac, and it just slides around at any possible position where they're 
not on the uh, stent. And then it puts in the renals, and this patient had uh, two left renals here. And it will keep going until it finds all the possible alignments that fit our rules. Um, and then it will use the sum of the, the least sum of the squares to uh, find the best uh, fit for it. And then it will generate this report, and we're working on having it do a couple other things, but I'm, I'm not going to bother with that today. Now we've studied this. Uh, the fellows go through the planning first, then I sit down with them and uh, maybe make some uh, minor adjustments, but uh, an experienced fellow can do this in about 23 minutes. Uh, the FenFit takes one minute. Um, and then we looked at how, how good we did compared to FenFit. About half the time, uh, we came up with the same plan that FenFit came up with. A uh, quarter of the time, we uh, came up with a plan that worked, but FenFit had a better plan that worked. And then 20% of the time, uh, our plan broke our own rules, and FenFit came up with one that would not break the rules. So it's definitely uh, an improvement. So we do use it all the time, but I still force the fellows to do, do it manually first. So we're just gathering more data here. And also we're making improvements to the program as it, uh, as it goes along. So this is the uh, FenFit uh, plan for the patient I'm about to show you. And this is the plan that uh, my senior fellow, uh, Nick Swerdlow, came up with for this patient, which is pretty much exactly the same. So this is a video that shows how we uh, make a uh, PMAG. So again, I'm using the alpha here. We go ahead and remove it from its sheath and then take away the nitinol constraining wires. I use a Bovi uh, for this just because the first time I did it, we didn't have a nerve hook readily available and I kind of liked it, but either way, there's a proline attachment at the back that we cut. Then we take the sheath off. I do that now at the beginning. Once I did that at the end and I didn't have a snap on the graft and after I had spent a long time creating it, I knocked it on the floor. So now I snap it, put it away while I take that sheath out. Now we're measuring the distances down that we had uh, planned ahead of time. And you could see on that sheet that we know where all the stents are, what their distances down are supposed to be. So we line it up based on that. And then we do the lateral distances for celiac, uh, SMA, and then the two renals. And then once we've got those all marked out, then I'll take a pair of calipers uh, and we'll mark out a circle around each one of these. I'm currently using a seven millimeter diameter circle uh, typically. We'll get a 12 and 6 and a 3 and a 9 marker, and then I have them fill in a couple, some extra dots between all of those to making sure to make it look like a circle and not a diamond. And then once we have all of those uh, in place, then we go ahead and start to remove these fenestrations. Now, it, you see there I fold the towel over to cover up those barbs. It took me a little while to figure out how to stop stabbing myself uh, in the hand, but this is a really nice technique. And then we use this handheld cautery to burn around the edge. We used to burn the whole thing out, but you don't need to. You just burn around the edge. It's uh, faster and, and safer. I like to use a nitinol, uh, sorry, a nester coil uh, as a marker. It's got excellent visualization because it's um, platinum. And then I like a three millimeter cuff of PTFE. And that combination, I think, really minimizes the uh, chance of a leak at each of these uh, fenestration orifices. And it might even be better than the custom devices, which just have a double layer of ethabon. So this is 5.0 ethabon, not 5 millimeter. 5 millimeter ethabon would be too big. Um, and we run that around through that PTFE cuff uh, in a locking fashion. And we try to get the uh, throws on the bottom third of that PTFE cuff. And that's so that we can get a good E version of that uh, cuff before we put it back in the sheath. It's a lot easier to cannulate if that uh, PTFE is all uh, exterior. And then we come from the other direction, and uh, <clears throat> I like to just get a little bit of an overlap between the two ends of that uh, nester coil, and then we tie it up. And so those are my big hands in the foreground, and that's uh, uh, my fellow uh, Jen Lee doing the sewing. We've got this down to a, a nice routine at this point. Uh, it takes us less than an hour to make these grafts. 
We had gotten it down to about 45 minutes, but I thought maybe we were rushing too much just to try to beat the clock. And so I don't let anybody watch the clock anymore and tell them to slow down and make sure they're getting enough sutures in. I don't pack these sutures as tightly as Cook does uh, because I have the nester coil and the PTFE cuff. I, I don't find it necessary and I've never had a leak there. And we've done about 200 of these so far. Um, if I'm not putting the PTFE cuff uh, there, then I will put it in a lot more. So now we're putting these nitinol wires back through. You go outside in on one, then outside in on the one next to it. And I try to take advantage of that curve in the alpha uh, so that we can keep the graft facing the direction we want. Putting those back in is probably one of the hardest parts of the procedure. You have to push down before you push up. That's really the key. And then I, we reattach that bottom trigger wire to the graft. You have to make sure you go through around a stent on the bottom. You have to make sure you're not through the gray positioner because then it would never come off the graft. And we tie that in place. We've had that slip a couple times. You really don't want that to slip because then it makes it hard to rotate the graft. So we put a lot of throws in there, some surgeon's knots, et cetera. And I mentioned that uh, Cook uses posterior reduction. So I use circumferential diameter reduction. I use a, a 5.0 uh, proline, put it every third stent wire, and then cinch it down to a diameter that's less than the inner vessel diameter that we had measured, and that's written on that sheet that's sitting uh, right behind us, taped onto the wall. So I use an aortic sizer, and we tie it down to uh, that size. Now, if there's a fair bit of tortuosity, I'll bring it down even less so that I can still rotate the graft. So this is all done so that we can still be able to rotate the graft and move it up and down. I find that if you're rotating, doing it up and down as you're rotating makes it much easier. And I want to avoid over tightening, especially on that bottom one there. So I take my big peel away sheath and just stick it inside there so that it can't be cinched down too tight. Um, we did that a couple of times. It made it a little bit harder to cannulate this graft. Now we put an umbilical tape around each stent. And just snap that in place to keep that down at its uh, most uh, reduced diameter that we can get. And then we'll also put an umbilical tape around the peel away sheaths. So that large introducer sheath uh, from Cook is an 18 French. And so I go up by six French and by two French. So this is a 24 French sheath that we'll go into first. And then the 20 French sheath will go inside the 18 delivery sheath. And I set it up so I can see my side and Jen can see her side, making sure that none of the uh, stents are catching in that crotch of the peel away sheath. And we're looking always for the nose cone. We don't want the graft to come out the other end. So we stop there. We load the smaller peel away, which is two French larger than the delivery sheath in. We push the gray positioner in all the way first, then the peel away. And then we line the two of them up and I hold some tension with my right hand, pulling back on the 20 French peel away into the 18 and then holding the 24 against the 20. And I had never before this video had an issue where it started to poke out through the side, but my fingers are there to feel if there's a stent that's starting to pooch out the side, which oh, there it is. So then we stop immediately, take a forcep and push it back in. You can't withdraw the graft or the, st or the barbs will engage uh, and then you'll be in trouble and you'll probably be throwing out the graft and starting over. Uh, so you just have to be cautious going in. I've never had to start over for that. I've always been able to load these in, but I, I like that 3228 uh, tapered graft because it is the smallest graft that goes in through this 18 French sheath. So that gives you the most room to add bulk like uh, fenestrations and branches. And then once we're sure the graft is in far enough, uh, we take the peel away out, we pull it out of the valve before we peel it away. And then we're starting to look for the uh, nose cone. It was getting to be a little of a struggle, so we flush with the heparinized saline. That eases the friction and lets you uh, introduce it a lot easier. And then we advance until we can see that flush port right there. 
and then we cover it. Now I used to do this before bringing the patient in the room and it used to take two to three hours when I first started, but now I can get this done within the same time that it takes anesthesia to put the patient to sleep and for us to do our 3D spin um, and, uh, and move on. So this case that I'm gonna show actually has the inner branch, so I just have a short video showing how we do an inner branch. So this is a Viabon. This is a nine millimeter Viabon. I wanted a three centimeter inner branch because it was two centimeters outside and we'll use a five centimeter Viabon. We tack down the heel, put the nitinol wire in there, and then we tack down the toe and put the, uh, the, sorry, the uh, nester coil uh, through there. And then this one, because I don't have a PTFE cuff, I do make her really pack it in so you really can't see any uh, graft there. All you can see is uh, ethabond. And I actually even do uh, a second layer. So this is her finishing up the uh, first layer and then finishing up the second layer. So you can see that it's much bulkier, uh, much heavier there. And I think that's helpful to avoid a leak uh, at these uh, sites where we don't have that PTFE cup. Now, we need to tack up the end of that branch and you can see how I moved it over laterally so that it wouldn't uh, interfere with the ce uh, celiac fenestration, which is actually the splenic fenestration. And then we take a picture of it with the date. So that was just from last week. <clears throat> We also do external branches. Um, I mentioned uh, posterior reduction. I do occasionally do that. Now I usually tend to do it with chromic rather than sending the trigger wire up through the back of the graft. Um, but I do occasionally do it. And then I used to do some uh, preloaded uh, wires, uh, but this requires arm access. And so I, I've gotten away from doing that. Now, CT fusion has been an integral part of our uh, treatment of these patients for quite a while now. I'll go through this process. We start by segmenting out the vessels of interest. Then we go through the planning stage where we can add ring markers to show the origins of various vessels and plan optimal viewing angles. Then we register to the patient, which is really to the table. Um, you can do 2D to 2D, but I like 3D to 3D or 2D to 3D rather. And then we go to live imaging. So the benefits of CT fusion, it definitely decreases radiation because you've got that roadmap on the screen and it follows the C-arm and table movement. So you always know what you're going to see before you step on the fluoro pedal and you can get the best angle without stepping on uh, the pedal. So this allows you to cut down on contrast as well because you, again, you know what you're going to see before you actually do it. And so it makes it easier for us to do these complex procedures. We know where the targets are, so the procedure length and the fluoro time are decreased. Um, so here's the planning that I did for the case that we're gonna do. First, just to scroll through to show the aneurysm. There's a little outpouching there just below the splenic. Um, then what I'll do is segment the vessel. So we just hover over it, and then I can use the scroll bar to tell it to include more or less and then just click when it's uh, on something I want. That's actually the portal vein that I didn't really want, and we'll see how I get rid of that later. That's getting that splenic, the left renal. That is the right renal, but for some reason that uh, didn't come out. And the hypogastric's there. And then I wanna see the upper aorta as well, and I always wanna see where that uh, left subclavian artery is, even when I'm doing these cases, because our stiff wires are gonna be up there, and I wanna know where it is in relation to that. And you can see how I just added in more info there on that right renal artery. I didn't notice that I had the portal vein yet. So now in the planning phase, I'll start adding these ring marks to show exactly where these orifice, orifices are. And this is really helpful during the procedure to have these ring markers. This is the key that makes this uh, type of operation so much easier than it was before we had this technology. So we get one uh, on the splenic, the SMA, that's where I noticed that I had the uh, portal vein, so I deleted it. Now I put a mark showing where that common hepatic artery takeoff is, and then the left renal, and then eventually the right renal. And we do fine tuning there because it's really helpful to have that really be perpendicular to the aorta uh, and really show you exactly where the orifice that you want to target is. And I've already got marks on the hypogastrics there. So now I want to plan the angles. And I used to do this where I would just rotate it until the ring lined up perpendicularly, but I just use the, the clock faces now uh, that we have. So I've got the, 
that planning sheet sitting next to me while I'm uh, at the uh, table planning this out. And so uh, if the splenic, I think, was at uh, 12 o'clock, so uh, we have a 90 degree angle. And you can see the other angles there as we uh, add them. And then I can go back and label them. So just in case you forget which one is going to give you, you know, this much LAO, et cetera. We put in angles for the hypogastrics as well, and I put one in there for the common hepatic. And you can relabel them so that you can pull them up at the table side, and you just press one button and then press a check mark, and it will spin the C arm around to that exact position and drop the detector down to minimize the radiation. And it makes it much easier and much simpler to get all of those uh, angles in there. So then we do a 3D spin. and uh, this uh, 3D spin that I'm going to show you here, that was actually a fluoro spin, doesn't give you the fidelity of a CT spin. I do tend to use CT, uh, uh, fluoro CT at this point. So you match up pieces of calcium on the pre-op CT on the right with the intra-op uh, fluoro CT on the left. And you get a bunch of pairs uh, throughout the area of interest. And then you double check that they're lining up one over the top of each other. And then you're good to go. So we've been able to show that just with CT uh, fusion, we're able to decrease our radiation dose, decrease our fluoro time, our contrast dose, and our procedure time for complex endovascular procedures. But we're not stopping there today. So I'm going to talk also uh, about this other technology that we're using uh, from Philips. This is the fiber optic real shape uh, sensing system. So there's a fiber optic cable running through the middle of the catheter and the wire. And that allows it to know exactly what its position is in shape. And then we register that against the patient and the table. And then we can track movements uh, without any uh, radiation. So this video, if it would play, would show you that as uh, Tilo moves his hand, the uh, system tracks it. I don't know why that's not playing but we'll move on. The benefits of uh, force are a reduction in radiation, and this is a reduction to the patient and the surgery team, which is important. It allows biplane view, so you can use two x-ray views that I'll uh, show, hopefully that video will play. Uh, you can have one x-ray view and then a 3D model, and we'll see examples of that. And then you can use visualization angles that are just not possible with fluoro. If you want to see something from 90 degrees of caudal, you'd have to cut the patient's legs off to do that with fluoro, but you can do that with the force system. The way it works currently, its best use is for cannulation and then delivery of a stiff wire for uh, subsequent treatment. So this just shows us setting up this uh, force system. It's got this docking top that clicks onto the docking base, which is firmly attached to the table. And then here's the guide wire, and you can see that the wire is attached completely. It's not detachable, so it's attached to this thing, so it's not backloadable. That snaps in there firmly, so now the system, once we plug in the bottom, will know exactly where that uh, wire and catheter are in space. And we plug it in down here, and then this cable runs into a, a a trolley and then that uh, processes the information and sends it up to the screen. So we put the catheter and wire in and we take two views and we just put a click on the tip of the wire telling the system where it is. And you can see how it knows where the rest of the wire is. And then we check it and you can do fine tuning to make sure that it's uh, accurate for both the wire and the catheter. And then this is us advancing it with no fluoro. And then we'll advance the uh, catheter and we'll put our stiff wire in there and we'll move on with our uh, procedure. So here we're just rotating the graft to align the fens, and then we'll put it in through the patient. We'll get it up to the level that we think it's gonna be just based on our 3D model there from the CT fusion. And then we'll spin it just to make sure that it's pointing anteriorly the way we think. We'll do a quick short DSA, we won't let the person stand there with their thumb on it for five minutes and then we do some fine tuning of our fen markers or our uh, renal uh, uh, branch markers and then we go ahead and deploy the graft and then now this is an opportunity to use the force so here we've got a biplane view no radiation we can see the catheter and the wire 
And with that biplane view, uh, Nick is able to uh, cannulate uh, this uh, alpha graft. There he's got it lined up, and there it goes. Catheter up, we follow with the wire. And once we get through the graft, we'll take the wire out. And then watch what happens when we put the stiff wire in. We don't have to fluoro that either. You can see how it deforms the catheter, so we know the stiff wire is in. And so we're all set. And now we put in our big sheath that we're going to work through to cannulate these fenestrations. You can see on the left there that the accuracy is not perfect. But we know that it's lined up pr properly, so we just keep moving. We know we're going through the fen. We've got our 3D model over here. We can rotate this around in any direction that we want. Um, when I'm working, I like to have that bullseye view to get through the fen. But now it didn't go easily, so we did a little injection. And now we can use that. It was just a fluoro injection, no DSA. And we can use that as our roadmap with our wire and our catheter to get out into that distal renal artery where we want. And we do a quick puff to make sure we're where we want, and then we put our uh, wire in. With this uh, steerable sheath system, when you've got that sheath bent, if you're exchanging wires, catheters, stents, etc., I advance until we feel it at that bend, and only then do we step on fluoro. So now we're going after that right renal artery. Accuracy is better here, so we're able to, to pop through. I don't like this angle. My common hepatic is in the way, so we add 45 of cranial, and then we can see that without any problem. We do uh, struggle a little bit with this wire. I will say this wire, it's, it's not a Terumo glide. It's modeled after the Terumo glide, but it's not a Terumo glide. And so we again take a picture, make sure that we're going the right place. There was some plaque at that orifice. And so I didn't mess around for too long uh, with this, and we just switched to a uh, Terumo glide. And I don't show it here, I edit it out, but we did struggle a little bit even with the Terumo glide uh, before it finally uh, slid right, right, right out. Uh, so we're make it look good, but even, the, even with the Terumo glide, it struggled a little bit. And now I stay on fluoro while advancing the catheter because I don't know what's happening to the wire otherwise. So um, you could have theoretically done that, but I want to know where that wire tip is. And then we exchange for our stiff wire and move on to the uh, celiac. So my partner Lars is cannulating the uh, celiac here. Pretty good accuracy in this uh, straight on view. I'm rotating this so we can get a good uh, angled view so we get a better sense of where we go. So he gets out through there and goes right into the hepatic artery. Um, we recognize that, and then he pulls back. We adjust our uh, steerable sheath, and he'll make his way out into the uh, splenic artery. All of this, no radiation. And again, I could rotate this around and look at it from 90 degrees of caudal, cranial, full lateral, AP, whatever. And I can just also slide it over if we want to see what's going on further out here. You can see well beyond the field of radiation. Give it a puff. We're happy. Stiff wire. So now uh, I'm taking this uh, Oscor. And I'm going to use the stent graft to help curve it back around so that we can get into that branch. And I pop that chromic uh, at the same time. I think I popped the top two chromics there. But then I'm able to. Uh, get a wire to come down, cannulate the branch. Hard to see probably a little bit, but you can see the four markers on the Viabon. Went right out the left renal. So then advance the catheter down into the branch and then switch the rotation, you know, without fluoro. Step on when I know we're in the right spot and now I can get the wire to go out the SMA. I can add in some of the uh, CT fusion showing where the SMA goes and then with fluoro. I'm using this. I'm not using the force for this because it's only a 120 centimeter wire and an 80 centimeter catheter. Um, they are working on that, so hopefully we'll be able to do more uh, with uh, force equipment in the future. A little puff to prove that we're in the right place there, and then a stiff wire. I tend to use an Amplatz with a straight tip in the SMA. And we just delivered our Viabon graft in place, and then we're going to come up and pop all of those chromic ties using a Coda balloon. I start right in the segment where the visceral vessels are because I want to anchor that in place first. Then I go up, even though they had popped, I wanted to get good seal there. And then I'm coming down and popping every single chromic tie. Then we go ahead and, and deploy one injection to prove that that hepatic is where we think it is. So then we deploy that 
via bond stent graft, and then we'll post-dilate that. That's a, a 12 by 4 balloon. The vessel measured 11 millimeters. A puff to make sure we haven't compromised the hepatic, but I'm, that's not convincing enough that we don't have a leak, so we go to a complete 90 degree angle and don't see a leak in that crotch. So we take that wire out and then we go back up and start working on the others. We use uh, a, a tour guide. This is an eight French uh, for this one. Or no, sorry, this is a seven French probably. Use a little inchworm technique where we uh, advance the dilator with the sheath, then we hold the dilator, advance the sheath, then advance the dilator. And I do all that in AP, and only when I'm ready to deploy the stent do we go to the lateral with increased radiation to perfectly position the stent and then go ahead and balloon it. And then we swallow the balloon take that balloon out. We only fluoro for a couple seconds, making sure it's coming out. Get the bigger balloon in to flare. We only look at that when we feel it at the bend in that steerable sheath. And then do an injection to make sure there's no leak, no dissection, and that we're happy with our placement. And then we go through, do the same thing, inchworming out into that right renal, delivering the stent. We're in AP and we can see that the fenestration lines up nicely, so we're happy. We don't need to rotate the C-arm anymore. We swallow that uh, balloon after deploying the stent and then again post-dilate with a larger balloon. These are all sped up 2x in case you're wondering how much uh, time this all takes. And I really didn't cut a lot of uh, extra uh, stuff here. This is pretty much uh, what it looks like in terms of uh, when we're on fluoro. And so, again, we don't fluoro until the stent is up at the corner, and then we rotate it to the perfect position, and then go ahead and deploy the uh, graft. Perfect position meaning having those, that fen line up so that it's not a circle, it's a straight line. Once we've got all four of those in, and we're happy with our injections that there's no, no leak, uh, no dissection, et cetera. We take all of those wires out. Now we need to put in a bifurcate. So I use a Gore 28 millimeter, uh, it's a 28.5 graft inside the 28 millimeter alpha. Go ahead and deploy that. Now we got to cannulate this gate. It's another opportunity to use the force with a biplane view. And uh, this is an AP view over here, and this one is an L or LAO view was a struggle, so I gave an RAO to go with the LAO, more separation, made it a little bit easier, and then Nick was able to get that cannulation done very quickly. You can see the accuracy issue here, so we knew that it was in because we just adjust for that accuracy in our brains. Um, Phillips is working on uh, fixing that. You see the stiff wire going in again. And then I always prove that we've cannulated that gate with that little dog bone view with a coat of balloon. And then we need to uh, uh, put in our uh, limbs. Uh, and for both of these, I wanted to land a little bit above the uh, hypogastric uh, because the artery was a little bit more dilated there and I didn't want to get into the smaller areas. And you can see how I'll, what I'll do is an injection with the graft in place and then just move that marker. Uh, they have a tool now where we can draw a line on there. They just haven't installed it in our system yet, but hopefully next week that'll be in, in place. And we balloon all those uh, overlap spots and sealing spots on both sides. And then I fairly routinely, uh, meaning now always, put in an extra gore cuff here uh, to get extra radial force and minimize the type 3 leaks. I used to have some type 3 leaks and I would leave the OR with them. We actually have a little bit of one right there. You can see it inside the alpha, outside the uh, graft. Um, I used to leave those and they're all gone on the CT, uh, but now I put that cuff in there to try to uh, get rid of them during the case. But we did leave the OR with that type three, but we got this CT not, not long afterwards. There is a leak there, but it's a type two from that IMA. As we go back up, you'll see it a little bit slower, nothing inside the alpha. It's all related to that uh, IMA. And we're done, and then this was the, Fluoro time for that case was 30 minutes and our radiation dose was 327 uh, milligray. And just to show that I'm not cherry picking, I'll show all four of the last uh, PMEGs that we did in the last two weeks. So on uh, Tuesday the 28th, 28 minutes of fluoro time, 240 milligray. 
on Friday the 3rd, uh, 24 minutes of fluoro time, 226 milligram. These are all four vessel PMEGs, all with a bifurcate down below. This is the case that I just showed. And then from last Thursday, uh, best yet, 22 minutes of fluoro time, 182 milligram for a four vessel PMEG with a bifurcate. Uh, so it's been a pretty dramatic Im improvement. I don't have enough time to show this, but just wanted to show how we can get some extreme angles with this that are just not possible with fluoro that make it uh, much easier to do these procedures and dramatically reduce the radiation. So we've looked at our uh, PMEG cases with and without uh, force and are showing a decrease in radiation, however you want to measure it, a decrease in the uh, fluoro dose and also the fluoro time, uh, significant reductions in all of those. So I talked about the limitations today. We have the guide wire and there's two catheters, but they're 80 centimeters, the wire is 120. They've got this 3D hub, which is going to be coming out within hopefully a month or two, which we can put at the back of any catheter. Um, it's got a little system in here that the, so the system knows when the wire is passing through this. You put the wire up to the tip of that and tell it that's where the tip of the catheter is, and now it knows where the catheter is. And so we can use it for things like this. I was use, experimenting with it in, in this model. Looks like this video is also not going to play. But if you pull the wire back inside the catheter, it will estimate the position of the tip of the catheter because it doesn't know precisely. It just knows the length of it. And if you pull it back more than seven and a half centimeters, it would estimate it until you readvance that wire. So we talked about the problem with the uh, catheters. We've got the 3D hub that's going to let us use up to 90 centimeter catheters for now because the wire is only 120. You saw the accuracy issues. They're working on an automated and continuous registration. We talked about the wire. It's not a Terumo. They only have the one type of wire in a 120 length, and it's not backloadable. But they've already got better wires uh, in production uh, that are glide wires. They're still working on making them uh, better. And once they get the backloadability issues taken care of, they can put it on Rosen's Lunderquist, and you can imagine what we can do at that point. So I think that the future of navigation is already here. They're going to be expanding this to, I think, for another 40 or 50 sites, hopefully by the end of the year, and, and then more widely. So our goal is to do these complex endovascular interventions with minimal and eventually even potentially without radiation. Um, new imaging systems help decrease our doses. 3D road mapping helps a lot, and this uh, fiber optic real shape sensing system when it's uh, catheter agnostic and backloadable, we'll be able to tell it what the position of balloons, stents, and stent crafts are relative to that 3D hub. And this isn't the only system. I'll say it's the only system that I've worked with, but I know there are others out there. Uh, I think it's an exciting future for us in, in endovascular surgery, uh, and we're going to do a lot more complex things easier with less radiation to ourselves and our patients, and it's an, an exciting future. And as much as I enjoy still doing uh, these cases, if I'm a patient, I want my thoracoabdominal incision to look like this. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to entertain questions. Well, Mark, that, that was breathtaking, perfect for this audience. Absolutely amazing. Um, let, let me kick it off and ask a question. When do you put an inner branch in? How, how do you make that decision that you've got to put an, an internal branch? So with, a, with an outer branch, you don't want the branch to get crushed. So if you're in, working in a smaller part of the uh, aorta, you can either put some permanent reduction on the graft in that area so that it can't crush the outer branch, or you can do an inner branch. So those are the two choices. And in, in that one, I didn't want to constrict it anymore to allow an outer branch. I had to use a branch because there was no way that I was going to get a, a balloon expandable stent to go through the fen and then immediately expand out to 13 millimeters within a two centimeter length. So I had to use a branch and then inner just made more sense because of less uh, uh, constriction on the graft. All right, questions. I'll ask you another question. That, so why do you use gore uh, at the bottom end as opposed to just Completing. Staying with Cook? Yeah. Well, um, it's one of the benefits of uh, having an IDE. Um, I can you know, mix and match uh, various components, whatever seems to work the best. I actually started out using Cook, but the problem is uh, with uh, they don't make a, uh, a 
bifurcated graft without a proximal bare stent. Mm. And so that pushes down quite a bit where your gate is going to lie. And so you, know, you have to cut off that bare stent. So that's an extra modification, and which I did for a while. And I used to, you know, if I could fit it in, I'd fit it with that uh, uh, bare stent. Uh, and then I started cutting off the bare stent. But the problem is when, when you deploy that, if you've cut off that top stent, it goes sideways. So normally when you're doing a, deploying a Zenith uh, graft, it's constrained at the top by the bare stent so that it stays straight. If you take that off, it's just going to flop sideways. And I had that happen where it just went sideways inside the graft. And fortunately, I was able to straighten it back up. But I decided at that point, no more. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's quite spectacular. But what I want to know is, I know you show that it leads to decrease um, flow time, but do you feel it makes the cannulation any less um, rapid, more rapid than you do it without force? And also, do, do you see less complications with that? Uh, yeah, I can say that uh, by giving you viewing angles that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise and having those two views, I think it does make it much faster. Um, there's definitely a little bit of a learning curve in terms of dealing with the, uh, those accuracy issues. You have to be able to, if it's, I used to just re-register whenever the accuracy was bad, but every time you re-register, you're stepping on fluoro two more times and you're adding more time to the procedure. And we just figured out that we're, our brains are smart enough to know that, okay, well, if it's off by that much, then I'll just know that I have to, you know, make that adjustment in my brain. Um, so yeah, I think having multiple viewing angles, viewing angles that aren't possible with fluoro, definitely makes it faster. The one place where it is a little bit of a drawback is that the torqueability on that wire is not as good. Um, it's completely attached all the way around, so you can't just keep spinning in the same direction um, or it'll break. So you have to go a few turns one way, then go back the other way, et cetera. And it's a little bit stiffer. Uh, so it's stiffer, not as torqueable compared to a glide wire. But despite that, I still think it's much faster um, than doing it otherwise. But if I have a, an orifice that has plaque on it, you know, I think it's, it's got a little bit more tendency to cause a dissection if you're not careful. And that's why on both of those renals, I abandoned it and, and uh, well, actually, on the left, we just did a, an injection when it wasn't going easily, and then we were able to go. But on the right, I switched to that glide wire just because the Taruma wire is, is the, the ultimate. And everybody has tried to make a Taruma glide wire. All the other companies have tried, and they've all failed. But I'm hoping that Philips can get at least uh, closer. And actually, what they've already got in the pipeline is much closer. And one thing I noticed was you had your entire graph completely uh, unsheathed, and then you, I'm presuming, sheathed it in the same thing. Does that ever change the orientation of the markers? Has it ever twisted the graph while you're sheathing it again? Um, no, I'm, I, I'm careful about, you know, because I use that bend to my advantage, because the aorta, as you're going from the abdomen into the chest, it, the aorta moves to the left and posterior. And so I We'll just take the graft and set it like this and then put my graft on there so that it's facing anteriorly on that bend. And I find that actually to be most of the time quite useful. Um, so I haven't had an issue with that. And yeah, there, there's a couple different ways of doing this. You know, there's so many ways to skin a cat here in terms of doing PMEGs. Uh, some people will only partially unsheath, then make the holes and then resheath. Um, it's difficult if you use the proximal device that I use unless you break off the uh, barbs, because otherwise you're not going to get that sheath to go over those barbs, or you're going to struggle with it. Um, and so I like to have those barbs there, and that's why I just take it off completely and then just put it back in. And it seems to work quite well doing it that way. The other thing you can do is you can use the distal component that has no uh, barbs on it, and that one some people will do. But again, I like the barbs, I like the bare stent, so that, that's why I do it this way. But it works quite well. Last question for you, and that, that is the responsibility that goes with having your own personal IDE. Tell us a little bit about how, what the FDA demands that you do. <laughs> yeah, so it's complicated. And uh, you know, we, 
spent a lot of time putting together the application, went through the pre-submission process with the FDA back and forth quite a bit. They're actually quite responsive and quite helpful. Um, the slowness was more on our end in terms of responding to uh, their questions each time. Um, but you have to, you know, based on your prior experience, they'll give you a certain number of patients uh, in, in each sort of arm. Most of our experience had been in the complex abdominal and less thoracoabdominal and dissection, so they gave us a, a larger number to start with for that segment and fewer for those. We filled up all of them and have uh, gotten them all renewed now which as long as things are going well, they're fine with that. You have to give progress reports. If there's any, at each one, you have to give lessons learned from any of the complications. You have to have a, an IRB, you have to have a DSMB or CEC or preferably both. Um, and then the paperwork is quite uh, cumbersome. Um, I was doing so many that uh, the hospital and the department worried that there was gonna be some kind of problem and that we should have an IDE for uh, protection. And I'm, I'm glad that we have it, but it was quite a process to go through and it's quite a process to maintain. I think uh, we started out with one FTE uh, to help with this for a research coordinator and that's not enough. Um, we're asking for that to go up to 1.5. And I know that other people have at least 1.5 or even 2.0 uh, FTE just to handle. So we're gonna divide up the work with one doing all the regulatory work with FDA and the IRB and the other one doing the clinical work, getting people signed up, making sure that everything is uh, appropriate, getting all the consultants, et cetera. So that's really, I think, what it takes. It's a, it's a lot of effort, but it's uh, worthwhile. And it allows you to publish and present. And uh, hopefully, you know, if we get enough people with uh, IDs for this, we can you know, combine the data uh, into a research consortium to uh, see how these outcomes uh, are on a wider scale. Well, I think it's the bewitching hour. That was a spectacular presentation. Thank you very much for coming down and Thank you. speaking to us. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>